it combines two aspects. Um, the notion of uh, future mobility and the notion of doing mobility in a uh, better way than today. Well, green mobility uh, for me is the combination of uh, green energy and, uh, and uh, mobility and electric mobility. For me, green mobility really stands for the future of mobility that's both um, environmentally friendly, that's um, good for our air quality in the places where we live, and that's also efficient. Green mobility, I think, is moving towards the direction that will sustain a collective future. If you look in the, into the future, um, I mean, most of the people will live in five or ten years, will live in city centers, and that's why it kind of like will evolve into that, so that urban mobility is kind of like equals uh, green mobility. So mobility is actually for everybody. A focus on cities and electric mobility is mainly driven out of cities first and then on the second stage obviously for anybody else outside the cities as well. But in total the green mobility means um, uh, from the production, distribution, uh, consumption, all the chain is green. Well, green is not about batteries. In, in Germany, um, hydrogen uh, has a lot of support. So it's really about looking at the different options and also looking at the long term. At the moment, uh, we look a lot at battery innovations, etc. But it's also very important to look at the fine print, to look at the details, because lithium, for example, and cobalt, two main ingredients that go into batteries, are very toxic. The way uh, their mind, uh, the footprint they leave in the countries where they come from, i.e. China in the case of lithium and um, uh, Africa uh, in, in one specific country, uh, cobalt. Uh, so you still have child labor involved. And all of those factors have to be taken into account as well when it comes to uh, a green footprint. Today, uh, year 2019, I think we are facing a tipping point of mobility again. We're realizing that we simply cannot continue running our shop, our world, running our mobility ecosystems in the way we've been doing in the past, whatever, five, six, seven decades. So we need to evolve, we need to change for the better. There's one book named Singularity. It's uh, near. It's, uh, this is my favorite book. I think this is, we should read it. In this book, um, he show how, we're, how, how the future looks like. And the, the possibility, opportunity is so much, but it's our, over our expectation. This is the key message. I admire uh, Elon Musk, despite the difficulties that he has, because he has an idea and he pushes this idea with all his might. And even if he does not succeed, he succeeds in getting the others at least uh, to move. Um, I don't believe in one source of information, it's the same. So um, you must think about all different aspects of mobility. It comes already, where do you get started? Where do you want to go? How do you get your mobility devices? How do you get your mobility patterns? So I don't think there's only one source where you can rely on. There's a blog called uh, Electrive. And let's say it's more like an insider uh, blog about automotive, uh, what is happening uh, in that field, electric mobility. Um, I really like that one. And of course, yeah, um, pretty uh, famous name, Nico Rosberg, of course. My favorite book at this present moment is The New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. And the reason for that is I truly stand by Albert Einstein's quote, which is that we cannot solve a problem from the same consciousness that created it. So a very good news site is called Greenvest, greenvest.com. It has information on transportation, on green cities, uh, smart cities, etc. So I think that is really a useful source because it connects the various pieces that are part of a wider vision. What I can encourage people uh, to look into, uh, also from a European perspective, is, uh, is um, uh, an interest group called Smart N. Uh, smart EN. Uh, it's a, it's a Brussels-based interest group that is actually a very interesting voice of the entire green energy sector and is also covering e-mobility. If you read too much, you tend to get carried away. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of you know, like having a more condensed uh, approach to things. I'm observing a lot. So whenever I travel, I spend a bit of time to really discover new ways of mobility, new ways of green mobility, new ways of green things. And uh, I'm trying to 
form my, the picture for myself because I think, uh, especially at that point in time, it's too early to bet on one solution only or to follow one guru only. So you need to be broad uh, in your perception and receptive to a lot of different stimuli. Uh, and things are evolving so quickly, so that's why having a prefixed understanding of the world of tomorrow probably is not the best concept going forward. Green mobility is absolutely at an infant stage. Um, we are still driven by combustion engines in many of our cities. That's going to change very quickly. We see differences in different um, regions, different um, geographies. Asia is particularly faster than anybody else because the problems are much bigger for transportation, just population size in Asia. But we see already that's a global phenomenon. Cities are thinking more into sustainability. How can we make the cities more lively to people? Um, and obviously that's driven by people. So um, cities are changing. I believe they're changing faster in Asia than anywhere else in the world. Um, but we see now uh, major trends in the US as well, but also in Europe. It will change more and it needs to be more. I mean, we're, we're talking about green mobility in Europe, etc. Green mobility is exactly where we are because we haven't entirely understood our place in the world or within ourselves. And that sort of unrest and dualistic energy where we just aren't sure of what our reason for being is, that we get so lost and wrapped up in doing, that we're frenetically always outward bound instead of ever will be willing to spend any time within ourselves. I think that dichotomy is so apparent in, in green mobility because you have the faction that is willing and wanting and truly embracing moving towards that direction and then those that just don't even believe in the facts that science affords them. But just in the beginning phase, from the population acceptance, I think in Asia, for normal people, we have the highest acceptance for uh, immobilities. Um, for the um, technical development, I think the, the uh, it's, it's beyond, uh, special in Japan, they are leading, uh, Japan and Korea, uh, also China. And uh, for the market development, I think in the US, they have the biggest market. This is very interesting because in China, the immobility, the more driver is the private companies because it's beyond from Shenzhen and the whole data area. Every year, they have so many new concepts for scooters, bikes, all kinds of new things. And the, the normal Chinese, for us, to use this kind of vehicle is to be cool, somehow cool. We like to use it. I think uh, Europe uh, and Germany in particular has been leading the sustainability movement and because of the, the strength of the mobility and uh, automobile sector in Germany, uh, Germany has been leading. At the same time, I think Germany has fallen behind in the last few years and other countries like China are gradually stepping up. E-mobility is very differently uh, in the different stages of maturity. Uh, you have, you have uh, city, uh, countries obviously like California who started, one of the first countries who started. Uh, you have countries like Norway who has a, a very big subsidy scheme and you see them, you know, Tesla's everywhere, Netherlands as well. Um, and then you have countries that are really only starting uh, to do this. I would position Germany actually rather on the low end. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, but with a lot of potential. I truly see green mobility at a slightly uh, overhyped stage. Um, why is that? Um, Allianz is the uh, leading car insurer on this planet. Uh, nobody insures more cars than Allianz today, but it's mainly combustion engine cars, yeah? And that's gonna remain pretty much so for the next one, two, three decades, because the turnover of the uh, Combustion engines and electric engine cars will take a while. I'm speaking mainly for Europe and also the US. We need to talk about China in a second. Um, so that's why I'm a bit um, overwhelmed with the excitement and the exaggeration of the green mobility piece. I'd say green mobility is at, is at an intellectual stage. We're still approaching it analytically and academically. And that's never going to solve for what we're really looking for in terms of resolution, because that needs to come once again from a more spiritual perspective, which inherently and intrinsically values, feels related to, connected to life on Earth. Into cities, I use the e-bike. I bore my wife uh, almost twice every week 
you know, what was the best investment that we made in the, in the last two years, the e-bike. With alternatives for private individual car usage. That means we are offering last mile solutions with an own proprietary technology that we developed only for this purpose. So we really believe we can make change to people's daily life and daily routines to get from A to B easily and conveniently. What NL wants to, to do here is basically to be an enabler to connect those two aspects. Uh, NL is one of the biggest uh, green power producer, uh, renewable power producer worldwide and uh, at the same time uh, believes in the need for flexibility uh, in the energy system of the future. We are an uh, equipment and ecosystem provider. Ehang, we provide the competence to flying. Flying means, in our understanding, in the future the best, the shortest way is the flying direct point to point. Through this way you save the time. Save time means save energy and save uh, CO2. Green mobility requires green energy. It needs to tick a couple of boxes. First of all, it needs to be available. <laughs> uh, and here we're always talking about the chicken and egg problem. Uh, the most beautiful or even the cheapest, most efficient electric cars have no value if you don't have infrastructure. So at the same point, uh, infrastructure without having a, a broad uh, uh, number of, of cars uh, using that infrastructure is of, no, is of non-value either. So availability is one thing. Um, I think affordability is the other one. Uh, China is uh, paving the way and showing us how you can go mass market with very substantial production and uh, implementation figures by solving that chicken and egg problem of infrastructure and electric cars and making it accessible for a broad range of people, not only the very top segments of the market. Third, uh, I still think uh, mobility needs to carry uh, excitement and deliver excitement. We need to work together because the cost for the infrastructure, if we invest new things, set up new port, new hub, we need to use this together. It's not a closed ecosystem. It should be an open system that everyone can use it. We should optimize the whole uh, energy uh, production and the distribution processes. This is not only one car or one scooter or one train. Um, so it depends on my daily usage, usage behavior, my patterns, that I use different kind of mo uh, mobility um, for different purposes. I think, honestly, it uh, needs to look good, honestly. I think that's one of the most important factors. And on the other hand, it needs to be affordable. In order to be a real alternative to other modes of transportation, I would say uh, we still need to work on regulation, generally speaking. We need to think about introducing measures such as carbon tax. Um, personally, I'm in favor of market-driven market options, but at the same time, those are sometimes not enough in order to change quickly enough. So really, we have to look again at the, the whole picture in order to see how we can change our behavior. Unfortunately, behavior change is rather difficult. So sometimes you have to push people to really bring about change in their personal lives. I think one of the key levers actually will be to to ban fossil fueled cars and fossil fueled motorbikes from city centers. I think you actually need to create spaces where new types of mobility can evolve, give back some of the greenness, you know, sort of the, the birds, the animals, and sort of bring some back some nature into city centers and make walking and cycling much more attractive for people. So it really isn't all about driving this huge electric SUV around the city center. It's more about um, actually handing the city center back to the people and make it, make it sort of more, a more livable um, place. And um, within that space, there's going to be enough alternatives people can choose from. The mix of, of, of energy <coughs> needs to be increasingly green. I think this is a given. Uh, the second topic is there's the, the necessity to be able to also charge your vehicle. Uh, which you know, increasingly will, be a, will become a, a reality. But I think also there are new ways of, 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 of traveling. And I think uh, you know, car sharing, sharing concepts will become much more relevant in cities in particular. The main levers, um, I think if we just replace cars with a, a, in, in internal combustion engine cars with electric cars and have the same number of cars in the end, 
it's not really a big achievement. <laughs> um, I think to introduce and, and also promote and motivate people to, to go on car sharing um, and to leverage new ways of, of mobility, I think it's, it's one of an important piece. We need, uh, in my humble opinion, regulations that allow and encourage us to improve that. But it also means a change on the personal level. And uh, I am, I am mind-boggled how many big cars I see uh, when I try to find a parking place in uh, Bonn in a garage. The connectivity when it's autonomous. Connectivity means for the end user, all the vehicle, it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle, they connect it. In one platform or different platform, we can use it from A to B as cheap as possible, as fast as possible. And the second biggest advantage is that all kinds of vehicles should be autonomously driving. It means for the charging, for the maintenance, for the, this is the most cost factors for the mobility. In Germany, or whatever is new, we are a lot of, um, we are very critical on things. So we have to see things first and um, see things happening. If it's happening, then we apply very quickly. Majority of people, they are living in cities which, with inefficient um, uh, modes of transportation. So convenience question. So if, if you offer alternatives for people's daily life, and they have a more convenient way to use, they're going to use it. Biggest opportunities. Um, I think the biggest opportunities are always those that big companies kind of like underestimate. <coughs> And um, yeah, as I said, would say this vehicle category between a motorbike and a, and a real car is uh, basically the best uh, example because it's something that uh, there is no like kind of like big player who is really doing something in this field. And so I think it's always like the, the little things uh, that are disruptive at the end of the day. Think about the wider picture as well, including smart cities and uh, what needs to happen in terms of mobility options to make smart cities happen in the future. The biggest opportunities always arise when you're solving problems. Again, that's why I'm getting so excited with uh, um, air mobility solutions like our passenger drones we're seeing around here. If you're solving the problem to not getting stuck in traffic when you want to go from Manhattan to JFK Airport. In order to really make improvements in this area, we need the, the interplay of three things. First and foremost, the willingness of the individual to change and adapt. The second is to have the technology available to deliver what is needed in the first place. And last but not least, definitely the appropriate uh, regulations that allow these technologies uh, to be implemented. not only the big players but merely the, the small players because they're agile and uh, they can really change much faster than uh, the big players. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of like a mixture of course because the small players they kind of like push the big players to keep up with them. The millennials really want green options and they want livable spaces, green spaces. So um, I think really the young generation has created more of an awareness. The youngest generation that are now maybe 16 to 18 years old, I would say that the green factor almost comes naturally. And I think there's a lot we can learn as adults because they have a, a great awareness that we don't have as adults. I actually think that um, consumer choice has huge power. And I think that the, the next generation, sort of our kids are already being I, they're growing up with a different mindset. Their environmental consciousness is much bigger than it ever used to be, you know, in their grandparents' generation. And I actually think that consumer choice and the ability to very quickly adapt to new technologies, you know, and use things that are, that are fun, that are easy, digital, um, and sort of inefficient, I think that will really drive change. What is fascinating to see is that um, uh, corporations, in many cases, are actually more advanced than politicians. Um, so you see like, and, and we see it as an L, the many international companies have a very clear agenda on becoming decarbonized until, you know, 20, in the 20s, in the 30s, uh, to a high percentage, up to 100% as an ambition level. And they, they, they have a very clear action plan to pursue that. And so I think there is sometimes there is much more engagement 
driven from the from the um, let's say the business sector than from from the political sector and I think that that can create a lot of good examples that can then also inspire polit politician and, and, and policy making I have a younger sister and we try to to do the the impact um, now but um, to do or to change the behavior of um, adults that grew up with these um, yeah, other techniques like um, uh, all-day car use, um, it's, it's pretty problematic. Yeah. The change to green, I think, is driven by ingenious individuals and governments. And on governments, I'm separating the world into China and cities. In the end, it is the people who make the changes. An organization by itself will not make a change. Uh, and if it is an organization that drives the change, it is because of the people who are responsible in running this organization. So it is a question of the people uh, who will make this change happen. Green mobility really is a matter of choice. And everyone, every day, really has the choice to, to contribute to that future of mobility. You know, it is the question of whether you take the bike to work or you take, you know, the tube or you walk, um, whether you actually buy a car in the first place. People understand now that smart cities of the future needs to be much more attractive for people and not for technology only. That means there's a strong focus on people, people's patterns, um, and that is where, where change is driven. What we see right now internationally in cities is there's a lot of change from a car-driven society to a more human-driven society, where you really look what can we do to make the lives of citizens better and easier and more livable? And that's obviously not only driven by, by having a car in my, in my parking garage. So it's more about how can we use city space better? And that is what cities understand. They're building different solutions right now in different cities and different legislations to make a car light city, how we call this in Singapore, um, more viable to people. we will really be able to draw on different mobility options. But also I think there's more of an appeal to stay actually where you are because we have created metropolitan areas that are actually livable, uh, more interesting. And, uh, and I think we do need these utopian visions also to create more sustainable options for us to live in. So I, I'm actually quite hopeful that we will be able to get, get it right eventually. The speed go to green mobility will be faster than here because the, the lobby from traditional vehicle automotive industry is not so strong in China like Europe or US. This is the one way. The second one uh, is the, 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 the normal acceptance from normal people is higher. We like to be cool, to use green mobility. The third one is the economically in China now. The green mobility is also cheaper. It's also the concept of how how do we deal as a society with mobility, and I think in that case, you know, you, you see examples also in Asia where, <clears throat> you know, densely populated areas like Hong Kong or Singapore, um, where where the idea of car sh car sharing or other forms of of mobility are already much more prevalent. If that is combined with electric or, or renewable uh, energy and and sustainable mobility in the case. I think that's going to be a major breakthrough. It's going to spread out from urban centers, but both horizontally with all sorts of uh, scooter ride-sharing uh, green mobility solutions, but also vertically with the drone concepts I'm so excited about. The inertia that we still have in our habits uh, People don't like change. Uh, we like to uh, we we like that things stay the way we are. The biggest challenge is the the production of the energy must be sustainable. Should it be the renewable energy? Otherwise, I save the energy from my car with oil and gas, but you I burn I get the electric from the coal. The you know it doesn't make any sense. It just uh, move the waste and uh, and the pollution. So this is the most challenge make the production where we get the energy sustainable and green. Politics is something that uh, companies, especially small companies, cannot change. 
And this is something that is kind of like uh, limiting us in kind of like creating new products because uh, first, maybe they're not legal as it was for e-scooters. There were uh, since uh, up to a couple of days in Germany, uh, e-scooters were not legal. And this is something that really needs to change this mindset that uh, politicians need to engage uh, in that field much more. Some of the pitfalls I see are really um, legislation. Usually legislation is behind innovation. We see more and more exponential developments. Um, there's a so-called singularity university in, in the US and uh, they focus on exponential growth and you can see that um, legislators are usually far behind what's happening in industry. Well, also the discussion about hydrogen as an alternative form I think there can be some coexistence in some areas, and I think that's that's really the challenge to not be, uh, you know, uh, not not have a very uh, narrow view on on, on that topic, but uh, but, a, but a very practical view. We need to do two things. We need to well drive uh, mobility concepts from a government or city government perspective. That's where public transportation systems come into the play. But we also must not force people to use what we think they should use. So this notion of individual mobility remains very, very important to me. The biggest challenge today, in my opinion, is, is actually that we still need a lot of, lot of talk to get things done. Our understanding is getting things done means making the first step. So we are on a good way forward to making the first step and everything we do is um, challenging um, existing systems and that's what we're going to do it, we have to make it better. So there is a change in, in mentality, I believe, in Asia. Um, the Asian mentality is much more quicker in adoption of new technologies. Here we question ourselves first, does it really make sense? What is the impact in 10 years? So we ask ourselves much more questions, many more questions. And frankly, you know, fossil fueled cars and modes of transport are still heavily subsidized, meaning that a lot of money is actually going into, into um, you know, m making fossil fuels cheaper. And this is really not a fair, a fair playing field. So, um, meaning that uh, green mobility today um, has is looking at a lot of competition, but that competition is somewhat artificial and it's driven by regulation. So, I think that's one of the hurdles. The most important thing to do is to to be curious, to ask the diff difficult questions, um, to. So also, in a way, you know, in a very small scale, in, in, in your personal lifestyle, you can do so many things differently and you can try to be more sustainable. Um, so I think it's, it's really a matter of, um, of being conscious about the topic um, of green mobility. You just get going, right? You just have an idea and just start. You can con consider 10 years for what, what is the right way to do it, just start. Um, every journey starts with the first step. That's what I learned as well. So we have to get going and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You think outside of the box. Um, it's a generic term, but it really, it really makes sense and be persistent. The first thing is, please thinking always systematically, not only part. You need a whole chain because it's a business in the end of the day. It's always business. So please think about the commercial feasibilities. Don't give up hope. I think it's really important to provide some light, some guiding light to other people. I believe the key technology for tomorrow should be uh, three. The first one is the, the autonomous driving, because this uh, reduces the cost for all uh, the value chain. The second one is the, the connectivity, because all the vehicles uh, work in one platform. Therefore, the user is very convenient and uh, cheap to, uh, from A to B, uh, even the cargoes. And um, of course, the uh, third one is the, um, we need, um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's no more ownership. It should be a sharing concept because the people, what they need is only the service, not the vehicle itself. Data-driven businesses. So it's a, it's a smartphone app, literally, that, that brings different modes of transportation together. So the center point is always the data behind because you want to get from A to B in the most convenient and shortest way, but also potentially the cheapest way to get around, right? So and, um, apps combine different modes of transportation typically and give you alternatives. So I'm, strongly, I'm a strong believer of um, software platform businesses that makes the way of people's lives in cities much easier. If you're looking to the future, at the end of the day, it's not about technology itself, it's about the services you generate with it. Obviously, whatever is autonomous um, has a good side and a bad side at the same time. Irrespective of all the technology that allows us to create or 
or support the existence or the, the genesis of life, it is being actively countered by other technology that is still stuck in the destructive pattern. It's really behavior change alongside with innovation in a humane way so that people will actually see the benefit that there is in connectivity and green solutions that are not only good for their own behavior, but also good for the planet overall. Being customer centric, it's very easy to get carried away with technologies, but uh, understanding what makes sense, what resonates with people, that's one thing. But still, on the technology side, um, cracking, cracking the question on how can uh, future mobility, future technology can uh, go to market in an affordable, efficient, scalable way. I think the future of, of, of green mobility really is where, where mobility is also part of the energy system of the future. So if you think about a system where the percentage, the share of uh, renewable electricity is very high, um, you have a high fluctuation. Now that fluctuation needs to be compensated somewhere. And if you think about um, you know, batteries on wheels <laughs> or batteries in second life um, or any other sort of decentralized energy assets can be used to compensate and, and, and balance. And because you know, we are living in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a time of digitalization, the digitalization or the, the technology is the layer that combines those two things. And I think we will see in the future much more integrated um, combination of, of energy sector and the, uh, and the mobility sector.